Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this installation service. Thank you so much for coming out. It's wonderful to see you all here, and the weather has cleared up for us. It looks very nice. Uh, just a couple of logistics before we get started. So if it's to use the restroom, you are more than welcome to. You'll just enter here on this entrance here, and just go ahead and put on your mask, go up the stairs, uh, just one flight of stairs into the hallway and you'll go down a hallway and it'll be a couple doors down on your left but you're welcome to use it uh, if you need to um, and then just by way of exit we are going to be going out this way so we'll start a people will exit from this way and then go out um, and then that way we can let everybody out who needs to who needs to leave um, but then for those who want to stay and if you want to visit out here in the parking lot you're certainly welcome to do so and you can either park in the parking lot over here or if there's no spots just circle around and then we can uh, we can park you back again so again welcome and thank you so much for being here it's wonderful to see everybody well good afternoon church I don't know how much it annoys the neighbors if you lay on your horn, so maybe just stick an arm out the window and let us all know you're here. It has been a long time coming to get to this space, and I'll bet none of you anticipated an installation service in this format, and yet how beautiful it is when the people of God gather in the spirit of the holy to celebrate occasions of leadership and guidance from the sacred and what a blessing it is to be able to be here today. At my size, I can tell you I'm incredibly glad I'm not having to try and preach out that window. So it is good to be able to stand in this space. If you don't know who I am, I am Reverend Colin Pritchard. I am the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Victor uh, and presently the moderator of the Presbytery of Genesee Valley. And in that role, it is a great privilege to be able to gather in this space to represent the broader church as we celebrate this part of the church which you know as your spiritual home. We delight in the opportunity to gather from north and south, east and west in the fellowship of the holy recognizing that there is a spirit in this place there is a spirit in the am radio there is a spirit in your car and there is a spirit in the gathered fellowship of the believers who call this place their church what a celebration it is and thank you for allowing us to be here what we are doing this day is taking a formal moment and a formal occasion to recognize something that has been true for a while to recognize that Nate, Nathan, is the pastor here and you are a fellowship and a community in this place. We'll put a stamp on a thing that has always and already been true. Thank you for gathering, taking the extra time to worship perhaps twice this day. Thank you for allowing your brothers and sisters in Christ around the presbytery to gather in this space and be with you. Thank you for letting the Spirit move yours in such a way that this can be a day of delight and installation. Congratulations on behalf of the Presbytery. It is good to have you here. Thank you. 
Now for the call to work. Let us read responsibly, please. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that clip clings so closely. Let us run. disregarded his shame and has taken his seat in the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endures with hostility against himself from sinners. Let us not grow or look apart. Please pray with me in prayer. Almighty eternal God, by your grace you have in place to be your servant people as we follow our servant Lord. Make your Holy Spirit move within and among us, that together we may live a new life in the crucified and risen Christ. Bind us together in faith as we receive all the spiritual gifts needed to fulfill our calling. We may support one another in common ministry through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. How quickly we forget our faith, our calling, our hope, all because we try to do everything our way rather than God's. And yet our God is quick to forgive and to call us back to the right paths. Therefore, let us confess our sins to God. Please pray with me. Almighty God, by water and your Holy Spirit, you baptized us to be your own and called the church into being. We confess that we hold back the love of your Spirit among us. We forget that we are filled with your Spirit. We do not listen for your word of grace. Speak the good news of your love. Live as a people made one. Mercy, God, transform our lives, power of your Holy Spirit, and make strong our common witness to the one Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which God loved us, even when we were dead through our sin, made us alive together with us and raised us up with him. By grace, we have been saved through faith. And this is not our own doing. It is the gift of God. In Jesus Christ, we are indeed forgiven. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
Oh God, by your spirit, tell us what we need to hear and show us what we ought to do to obey Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. There are two scripture lessons for today's service. The first one is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verses 1 and 4 through 14. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, Only when Babylon's seventy years are completed will I visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. The second reading is from the first letter of Peter. It's from chapter 1, verses 3 through 12. Blessed be God, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if for now a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that was to be yours made careful search and inquiry inquiring about the person or time that the Spirit of Christ within them indicated when it testified in advance to the sufferings destined for Christ and the subsequent glory. 
it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in regard to the things that have now been announced to you through those who brought you good news by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Will you join me in prayer? Holy and living God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. At our house in Missouri, the previous occupants had put their name on the mailbox with sticky letters. Not that abnormal a practice. I don't know who they were or how long they lived there, but they were there long enough that those sticky letters had mostly peeled away and the rest of the mailbox had weathered and faded. So even where the letters themselves were gone, their name was still imprinted on the mailbox in a deeper black. Like I said, I don't know who they were or how long they lived there, but I know that they were not pastors and the house was a manse. So it always struck me that though this was a very temporary place for them, though they didn't own the house, that they could have been asked to leave at any time if the church hired a pastor who needed housing, they still stuck their name on the mailbox in this fairly permanent way. They still put down roots there. They still made this short-term situation their home. In the first passage we heard this afternoon, Jeremiah's letter to the exiles is a message to a people living in a temporary situation. Stuck in a state of disconnect between what was known and comfortable with what was known and comfortable to them existing in a sort of in-between that they did not like. They were far from home, in a strange new place, living in strange new circumstances. They were undoubtedly experiencing culture shock. Everything they had known had been taken away from them. Everything that had angered them was just gone. Their whole way of life was suddenly obsolete. So the message in this letter that Jeremiah sends them was maybe not exactly what they wanted to hear. They were probably hoping for a letter that said, don't worry, you'll all be coming home soon, just hang in there, this will all be over before you know it. Instead, Jeremiah tells them to build houses, settle down, make yourselves comfortable, put down roots. You're in this for the long haul. It's not exactly a comforting message. It doesn't feel all that encouraging. It's probably not the kind of hope that the exiles in Babylon were looking for. Or maybe on the other hand, they felt like this kind of exasperating and contrary message was par for the course for Jeremiah. It's interesting though, that from this letter that undoubtedly received pushback, that had to garner frustration, that could not possibly have been universally well received, we have picked out one verse that we like to hold on to as the epitome of comfort and encouragement and hope. Verse 11 has become almost a cliche. We love to use it as an affirmation that God is on our side, that God wants to bless us, that God has good things planned for us. When divorced from this passage, that one verse can become a warm, fuzzy, feel-good sentiment without a whole lot of depth. But when we put it back into its actual context, 
when we hear it in the setting of this unsatisfactory sounding letter to the people in exile. It loses its charm as a simple pat phrase. It becomes a lot harder to process. And it also takes on a whole new life. Jeremiah's letter is not meant to make the people feel good. It's not meant to give them a warm, fuzzy message about God's blessings or tell them that God is on their side. It's not intended to be pat words that they can hang on their wall or repeat when they happen to be having a bad day. This is a letter to people experiencing the worst times they could possibly imagine who are watching the whole world turn upside down, who are feeling like every aspect of their lives has been disrupted or reordered or taken away, and who are now told that there is no quick path out of this. They're stuck here for the foreseeable future. And yet, God still has plans for their future. Jeremiah's letter to the exiles is not a warm, fuzzy, feel-good message. It's not a fluffy sermon for a comfortable Sunday afternoon. It's a testament to God's faithfulness in the long haul. God's constancy through all the storms and upheavals and struggles and tragedies that they are experiencing, the ones they imagined and the ones that they can't even find the words to describe. And it's a call for them to mirror that faithfulness in their own lives, even as they face these immensely challenging times. Living in a temporary situation, stuck in a state of disconnect from what is known and comfortable, existing in an in-between that no one likes. That sounds an awful lot like the church in 2020, doesn't it? The church, capital C, has already been experiencing an era of transition for quite a while before this year. But 2020 has forced us to face that reality in a whole new way. It's forced us into a season of new things. Forced us to let go of so many practices that we've known and held dear. Forced us to step out of our comfort zones in ways we never dreamed we'd have to. Forced us to change almost every aspect of life as we've always experienced it forced us into a whole new reality that seems so far away from the things we know and like and want. And here you are, living through this time with a new pastor, too. In the midst of all this upheaval, in the midst of so much change, in the midst of all the confusion and grief and frustration and discomfort that we find ourselves in, I hope we can hear that God's words through Jeremiah are for us, too. Not as a pat phrase, not as a warm, fuzzy cliche, but the fullness of these words in all their depth, in all their difficulty, in all the ways they still call us forward. God is still telling us as God's people, this is where you are. Build houses, settle down, get comfortable, put down some roots. This is not a fleeting departure from all the things you knew and liked, all the ways of the past you're still longing for. This is the new reality. You're in it for the long haul. We don't necessarily want to hear that message any more than the exiled Israelites did. It might make us want to push back in some of the ways that they must have 
it might not be a message that we receive well across the board any more than they did. So we are called to hear once again the fullness of this testimony to God's faithfulness, God's constancy, God's promise, God's presence through everything that we face. We're called to hear the logic-defying affirmation that even in all the uncertainty that unsettles us, all the upheaval that disrupts our lives, all the grief we feel in the midst of change and new things, God is still present and at work. We're called to hear these words not as a cliché, not as just a phrase we repeat, not just in a warm, fuzzy, God is on my side kind of way, but as the long-reaching, fear-dispelling, life-giving promise of hope for a people in despair, of a future for a people cut off from who they understood themselves to be, of a home, of blessing, of a place, of belonging, for a people who are lost in so many ways. We are called in our own darkness, our own struggles, our own challenges, our own grief, to keep hearing the promise that God is here, that God is doing something even in the midst of the worst times imaginable, that God's plans for us cannot be toppled by anything the world has thrown at us. We're called to keep hearing and trusting the promise that if we look, if we seek, if we answer the call to mirror and live into the faithfulness God shows us, we will find the Holy Spirit still blowing through our lives and our world. In this season of transition, in the midst of so many changes, so much upheaval, so much grief. We might feel like we're in our own kind of exile. None of us know what the future of the church is going to hold here at IPC or anywhere else. We don't know how long worship is going to have to look so different from what we're used to. We don't know how many more changes and transitions we're going to have to go through before we find some semblance of an equilibrium or something we can call a new normal. So in the midst of all that, may we let ourselves truly hear the fullness of God's words through Jeremiah today. May we let ourselves believe them. May we let ourselves live in and embrace the here and now. So build houses, plant gardens, let yourself live, let yourselves grow, let yourselves put down roots where and when you are. Don't just try to skate through this time and hope that it'll all be over soon. Go ahead and stick your name on the mailbox by the radio transmitter. Invest in this new pastoral relationship you're building. Step forward into the unknown together. Hold on to each other as you experiment, as you try new things, as you stumble, as you get up again. Let yourselves do ministry, live, find joy, thrive, flourish even. The work will be hard. The path will not be easy. The journey may not be a quick one. But God is still here. God is still at work. God still has plans for all of you. So as God's people, may we let ourselves hear those promises, trust in God's faithfulness, and walk in service to and in hope of the future that God still promises for all of God's people. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Friends, we are called out by God to be the church of Jesus Christ, a sign in the world today of the new life that God intends for all. In our life together, we are to display the new reality that sin is forgiven, reconciliation accomplished, and the dividing walls of hostility torn down. As the living body of Christ, the church is called to proclaim the good news of salvation, to pre present the claims of the gospel on people's lives, and to demonstrate Christ's love and service to the world. We are called to undertake this mission even at the risk of life, trusting God in all things. In faith, we embrace a new openness to what God is doing in our time, a renewed obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ, and a new joy in our common worship and work. Today, we reclaim our historic calling and remember the great ends of the church, the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God, the maintenance of divine worship even in a parking lot, the preservation of the truth, the promotion of social righteousness, and the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. The ministry of the church is shared by pastor and people so that all together may fulfill the mission to which we are called in Jesus Christ. The particular responsibility of the ministry of the word and sacrament is to build up the church and serve the people of God so that the word may be rightly proclaimed and the sacraments rightly celebrated. The call to this ministry has been extended by your congregation accepted by the candidate and approved by the presbytery therefore the presbytery of genesee valley by means of this commission now installs reverend nathan mochizuki as pastor of the irondequoit presbyterian church and there are some questions associated with that sir you ready here's what i know I know enough about Nathan to know that these are already in practice and displayed. This is a public affirmation of what God is already doing. But I ask you these questions, sir. Do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, creator, redeemer, and sustainer? He does. Do you accept the scriptures of the New and Old Testaments to be by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? He does. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Will you be a minister of word and sacrament in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and continually guided by the confessions? Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry working with them subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? He will. Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? He will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? He does. Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? He will. Will you be a faithful minister, proclaiming the good news in word and sacrament, teaching faith, and caring for the people? Will you be active in government and discipline, serving in the governing bodies of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus the Christ? He will. Ask our congregation some questions. And then please answer with I will, in the first two, or we will, and we will, and we do, in the last two. Do we, the members of the church, Accept Nate as our pastor, chosen by God through the voice of the congregation to guide us in the way of Jesus Christ. We do. Do we agree to pray for him, to encourage him, to respect his decisions, and to follow as he guides us, 
serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church. We do. Do we promise to pay, pray, uh, pay him fairly and provide for his welfare as he works among us, to stand by him in trouble and share his joy? Will we listen to the word he preaches, welcome his pastoral care, and honor his authority as he seeks to honor and obey Jesus Christ our Lord? We do and we will. Our prayer of installation. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good to give our thanks and praise. We praise you, gracious Lord, for you alone are God. You have made us, and we are your people, the sheep of your pasture. You have led us to green meadows by cool waters, satisfying our every need with your love. You have shown us paths that are right. Through shadowed valleys of despair, you have been our comfort and our hope. Over long generations, your presence has sustained your people. In your good time, you sent Jesus, your only beloved, to be our shepherd. He knew and loved your own, calling all who would hear him to follow. The good shepherd laid down his life for us, risking the cross for the hope of resurrection. By the power of the risen Christ, you gathered the church together to live for you in newness of life, a holy nation, a priestly family, a people chosen as your own, and called to proclaim your marvelous love. Gracious God, up your Holy Spirit upon us that we may be faithful as your people and fruitful in the ministries you have given us. Grant diligence to those who lead, faith to those who teach, truth to speak, compassion to all who heal, wisdom to those who counsel, generosity to those who give, and cheerfulness to all who serve. To your servant Nathan, and, all to all, and to all who tend your flock as pastors among your people, give vision and strength, hospitality, humility, and peace. Bless the common ministry of this pastor and people with joy and power in the gospel. Strengthen us to live out the grace of our baptism and to serve you with the gifts of your Holy Spirit. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our only shepherd and Lord. Amen. And so, Nate, I have the distinct privilege of saying you pulled it off. You guys did it. You made it. You are here. This long-awaited celebration and formal moment of connection has happened, and it is here. And so, as a minister of word and sacrament in the Church of Jesus Christ, you are now installed as pastor of this congregation, the Arondacoit Presbyterian Church. Be faithful and true in your ministry, that your whole life may bear witness to the power of the resurrected Christ. You can all celebrate a little bit right now. What a joy it is to share this day with all of you as we celebrate the calling between Nate and the Arondacoit Presbyterian Church and pray for God's abundant blessings on your ministry together. Nate, you and Elaine share the blessing of being a clergy couple, and you fully understand the joys and the challenges involved in this ministry. You can be both spouse and colleagues to one another, you probably have moments when you both get really excited over the same amazing bit of exegesis. Yes? <laughs> yes? <laughs> and maybe you even have a few jokes about obscure bits of biblical knowledge. It is immensely rewarding to share the vocation and the gift of marriage with one another. But being a clergy couple can also be keeping track of double the evening meetings, planning, and 
worship for two whole churches every single week and pulling off that spiritual marathon that we call Christmas Eve and Holy Week. Of course, figuring out Sunday mornings for your sweet daughter, Tessa. There, in the midst of challenges, however, I am convinced that there is life in all its fullness through the joy of your relationship with God, with one another, and with the churches that you serve. There is a blessing of raising a daughter with two whole churches to love her. And there is the immeasurable gift of shared purpose and values as husband and wife. And so today I'd like to honor and to celebrate this blessing that Nate, you and Elaine share as a clergy couple. And following the lead of our acting presbytery leader, Susan Orr, who at my own installation last fall asked the very same questions of me, I'd like to do the same, offering a variation on some questions that will be familiar to all of us as a way to acknowledge and to honor Nate's commitment to his family as well as to this church. So Nate, I invite you and Elaine to come forward for a moment now. Nate, do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Acknowledge him Lord of all and head of your family and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Will you fulfill your covenant commitments to your family in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by Will you in your own family life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love one another, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of your family? Will you pray for and seek to serve your family with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you be a faithful husband and father, proclaiming the good news, teaching faith, and caring for those you love? And in your family life, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Nate, may God's richest joy and blessing be upon you and Elaine and Tessa as you share this gift of life and ministry together. Amen. Great. When Nate asked me to be a part of his installation commission, I was delighted until he suggested that my role be that of charging the congregation. When I pondered my hesitation, I realized it's because I know you don't need to be told or motivated to welcome and care for Nate. Because welcoming and caring for people is what you do at IPC. It's part of who you are. Now, while some of you know me and understand why I have reason to believe that, many of you don't, because my connection with your congregation has been one of those PCUSA connectional things that usually happens behind the scenes. It began in 2011 when I was working for the Presbytery and learned that the newly selected Presbytery leader, Amy Fowler, had a pastor spouse who might also be open to a call. Aware that you were then searching, I got in touch with Jim Tappan, who was chairing your PNC, and ultimately, as you well know, you did call Jean. Fast forward several years, and I was um, a new Committee on Ministry member and delighted to learn that one of my liaison churches would be IPC. Thus, I began to have coffee with Gene every few months, and I heard about you and your ministry and his and Amy's comfort in your midst. It was also during that time that the Dewey Avenue congregation was looking for a new church home. And I learned that of all the places they visited, you were the place that made them feel the most comfortable. I shared that first picnic over by the zoo where you began to welcome them into your midst. And when Jean retired, I worked with your session to help them find Twyla 
and I worried momentarily that you would respond a little less graciously to a purple-haired Gen Xer than you had to Jean. But you welcomed Twyla and continued to tend to the work of Bean Church. And most recently, I've had the pleasure of spending many hours with your PNC and getting to know them and Nate. So you see, I don't know all of you, but I do feel very connected to you as a congregation. And that's how I have confidence that you're going to care for Nate. I know that you won't make it difficult for him to take care of his family by doing the things he needs to do, like taking his vacations, his paternity leave, his study leave, and whatever respite time he needs each week to be sure that he remains healthy and energized and spiritually nurtured to be your leader and your pastor. So since you're doing that is a given, I want to focus my charge on the part of your mission statement you call branching out to serve. I understand that following a period of analyzing and assessing your current mission projects, the measuring mission team and PNC have considered and the session has approved an intentional shift in your branching out vision to one that involves planning for outcome-based projects that focus on local outreach and direct contact with the people you're serving. I heard words like missional, relational, and collaborative. And we all understand collaboration, and you're doing that already. Some with Somerville, through Riverside Neighbors, with other churches in the Presbytery. Missional and relation, relational, I've learned means mission that is driven not solely by biblical imperatives, as in the Lord's instruction through Jeremiah in this afternoon's scripture, to seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you, but also and importantly by our context. And what is our context here in Rochester? We live in a community with a concentration of poverty at its core. Something we're slowly beginning to recognize is the result of deliberate efforts on the part of past community leaders to erect barriers to prevent minorities from living in white neighborhoods in the suburbs. This racism and its economic impact have led to a city with one of the highest child poverty rates in the country and a school system with the lowest student success rate in New York State. Nationally, we've been characterized as the poster child for having the most segregated city suburban school district boundaries in the country. And now we're a city with a fractured police community relationship. The individuals and families suffering from these realities are many and their needs are daunting. And I understand that you are working to forge out relationships, reaching out to these people and learning more about them. You're exploring how to relate more directly and collaborate with those who are disadvantaged. Being in dialogue with these folks and the community program leaders working with them will enable you to maximize your efforts. You will need to assess your gifts in the congregation and determine how they can best be used to connect with others. I think about your warmth and inclusivity, your musical talent, the child care program housed in your building, your work at Cameron, and the refugees living in the Rochester area. How will you marry your gifts and these opportunities? I charge you personally to think about your own passions and bring them to the process of crafting your mission programs. One of the specific qualities sought in a new pastor by your PNC and found in Nate was the desire and the capacity to lead you in this missional direction. More interactions with your community may also provide a bridge, enabling others to meet you and be invited into your work and worship, thereby enhancing your capacity and your resources. So while I charge you to keep being the warm and nurturing community that you are, 
I also challenge you to drill down on the needs of the broader community and bring your own passions and gifts to this missional work of the church. I've no doubt that the Lord has a plan for the work you and Nate will do together on behalf of his kingdom here in Irondequoit. And I look forward to watching that unfold. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us, your faithfulness, for the ways that you call each of us, and for the ways that you have provided for each one of us through the faithfulness of others. So we pray that as we give these gifts, that they might enable the next generation of leaders to continue on in their study and preparation to the ministries that you have called them to. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. experience this is that I will always remember. Thank you for joining me in this grand experiment of uh, installation service outside in the parking lot. Um, so we will be leaving today after the postlude this way down this driveway so the cars in front will go out first and the cars behind will follow. Uh, for those of you who would like to stick around to visit, you, again, you can either park in this parking lot if there's space. It will be easier just to drive around back and let everybody come out and then park here. But again, thank you all for being here. It's wonderful to see you all and to the Arundacoit Presbyterian Congregation. I look forward to our continued ministry together. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.